Hi everyone, and sorry for the little technical glitch there. We had some problems with the sound, but we're back. Um, again, today we're talking about various military service credit topics. Uh, again, we're not going to be going into an in-depth um, discussion about all the rules pertaining to military service. We have two other webcasts, at least, on OPM's YouTube channel. We've got one specifically focused on USERRA provisions, um, and we've got another one dealing with post-56 post military provisions in general. So um, if you want an in-depth discussion about all the details of post-56 military service in USERRA, um, I highly encourage you to check out those webcasts on OPM's YouTube channel, as well as any of the other webcasts that we've done. We've got a lot of great information out there. Um, again, today we're going to be talking about some various topics that, um, based on phone calls, emails, have come up recently and that I feel we really need to discuss to bring these things into play. Plus, we also have a new BAL that has recently been published, and I really want to go over the details of that. So, um, just to give you kind of an overview or a history of military deposits, what really drove this whole thing was Social Security eligibility. Now, for those of you who have been through any of our other classes, particularly the FERCA classes or the coverage classes, you know that in general federal employees um, became eligible for Social Security with the Social Security Amendments of 1983 that went into effect on January 1st, 1984, which changed how our our civilian retirement systems worked, right? We went from SERS to SERS interim and then to FERS and SERS offset. Um, in a similar way, something happened with military service. Prior to 1957, Social Security taxes were not withheld from military retired pay. However, as of January 1st, 1957, Social Security, Social Security deductions or taxes were withheld. So as a result of that, Social Security got the first opportunity to credit that military service in the computation of their retirement benefit. So again, to credit it in a civilian federal retirement, employees who were going to be eligible for Social Security um, would need to pay a military deposit. Um, so again, as I said, Social Security had the first opportunity to, to use that service. And in general, you can't get credit for service in two different benefits and only pay for it once. So that's what precipitated this whole um, post-56 military deposit. Okay, um, and SERS um, versus FERS, as far as the presumption of Social Security eligibility, is pretty straightforward. Again, if you've been through one of our other classes and you understand coverage, because SERS people are straight SERS people are excluded from Social Security. So, for example, if you had some military service, you had no private sector work, and came on board and were covered under CSRS, worked under CSRS, you were not paying into Social Security. Mm -hmm. The only Social Security credits you would have would have been for the period of military service if that occurred on or after 1957. And so you probably wouldn't be eligible for a Social Security benefit, depending on the amount of military time that you had. For FERS, because FERS is a three-tiered retirement system, we have the FERS basic benefit that OPM administers. We also have the TSP program, which is another component of that three-tiered retirement system. And we have Social Security. FERS was specifically designed to accommodate federal employees paying into the Social Security system. So therefore, the presumption is that FERS people will be eligible for Social Security, which is why military deposits statutorily are required for FERS people who have military service. So hopefully that actually clarifies the the difference in these rules. And again, if you want more details about basic military service, um, I suggest you check out the, um, one of the webcasts that we have on OPM's YouTube channel. Now, as far as what we consider creditable military service, um, the service has to be honorable, active service in the uniformed services. And the discharges have to be under honorable conditions. And the types of discharges that are under honorable conditions are clearly 
honorable discharges, separation because of hardship, transfer to the retired list because of age or disability, um, and transfer to Fleet Reserve is another one. Also, furlough to re reserve forces, a general discharge under honorable conditions. Now, here's where things get a little dicey. Um, a lot of times you will see just a general discharge with no character assigned to it. Please be aware that if you see a general discharge with no character assigned to it, that we cannot use that service. Um, the person who has that general discharge will need to go back to that branch of service and petition to have a character of service assigned to it. So it has to be a general discharge under honorable conditions, okay? Um, just a general discharge by itself is not enough. Also, death in action. So again, we do get these questions from time to time and people provide the documentation. All this information is located in the SERS and FERS handbook. I know um, that specific chapter has not been updated in a while, but nothing as far as these discharges has actually changed. So be aware that that is still valid information. Now, another question that we get very frequently is the type of documentation that is necessary to prove that a period of military service is creditable or potentially creditable on the civilian side. The gold standard for this, of course, is a DD-214. If you can provide a DD-214 for each period of service, that is fantastic, okay? Um, discrete periods of service should have DD-214 so that we can, so that in a case like that, a person, if they choose to, they can make deposits for discrete periods of service. Um, but a DD-214 is the gold standard as far as documentation goes. Or the equivalent of a DD-214 if you don't have DD-214s. Um, we do not accept point summaries. Uh, we get this question quite often. Again, we do not accept point summaries. They are not a valid form of documentation. They are great secondary evidence, but it's nothing that we can use by itself. If you have a point summary, that person, that former military member, needs to go back to that branch of service and get a transcript of service. Um, so basically translate that point, those points into any potentially creditable service, okay? Um, orders are fine, but they must be accompanied by leave and earning statements for the period or documented on the certified copy of the orders. They'll put a stamp, they'll have it signed, they'll have the leave and earnings for that period. Um, so again, orders by themselves are not appropriate documentation because you can have orders issued, but a person may not show up. So, I mean, there are potential um, pitfalls with that. So that's why we always ask for leave and earning statements to accompany those orders. Now, I really wanna to touch on this form because we've got some new information on this. Okay, the Air Force IMT 1613. If you see one of these forms, it's really gonna depend on when this form was completed as to whether or not we're gonna be able to use it. Um, so I wanna talk about what you actually need to look for and why there was a problem with this form. Now the problem with this form initially was that this Air Force IMT 1613 um, would have both Title 32 time and Title 10 time. Okay, it would have all different kinds of service on it. And that was a problem because in general, you can't credit Title 32 time, uh, Title 10 time is actually creditable. You can make a deposit for that and combine it with your civilian service. So that was the issue. And at this point, I really wanna give a big shout out to the people at DC Pass and Tawana Smith in particular, she's been working with DFAS on helping us to um, really clarify documentation. And she worked with the Air Force and DFAS to actually clarify um, and, and get this form, this Air Force IMT 1613, to a point where we could actually use it as documentation. So, what to look for on this form? If you see, we've got a sanitized version right here. Um, and you notice all the from and to dates and everything. 
where I really want to draw your attention is about um, a, a little over halfway down the form on the far right hand side, that um, little section that's highlighted in yellow. It basically emphasizes the fact that this is all Title X time. And so it is creditable for civilian retirement purposes. If you see that on this form, then this is appropriate documentation. If you do not see that remark on this form, it was probably done sometime before this situation was resolved. And this by itself is not going to be appropriate documentation. You're going to have to go back to the Air Force and have them separate out what time is really actually creditable to combine with the civilian time. Okay, so, but if you do see this note that says that all the time on this form is Title X time, then this is an acceptable form of documentation. This is something new, and again, thank you, Tawana and DC Pass, for helping to facilitate um, to make sure that we can actually use this form in the future as appropriate documentation. Now, I know we've talked about appropriate documentation and the deposit. Let's talk about the amount of the deposit. Again, this is kind of a review. Uh, for FERS people, the amount of the military deposit is 3% of the military earnings plus interest. For SERS people, it's 7% of the military earnings plus interest. Um, now, some additional counseling points. Our counseling is actually going to be even more important now, um, particularly for you USERRA people, where you have the alternative calculation, where, for example, the military deposit cannot exceed the amount of the deductions that would have been withheld if the person was in a civilian appointment um, at the time if they were in leave without pay US. So in a case like this, when we've got somebody who's in FERS RE and FERS FRAY, just be aware that those deductions under FERS RE and FERS FRAY are actually higher. And the military deposit under FERS is still 3%. Now, when FERS deductions were 0.8%, almost always the civilian time, if the person had civilian, that the civilian deposit would be actually um, more to the employee's advantage. They would have to pay less. However, when we've upped the retirement contributions, particularly under FERS Frey, um, in those cases, the military deposit a lot of times is going to be um, more advantageous to the person. That's going to be the lower amount. So just be aware that whenever you're doing these, that um, particularly if you're dealing with FERS Frey and FERS Ray people, the difference in the alternative computations is going to be a lot closer. And in some cases, the, mili the actual military deposit, the traditional military deposit computation may be the more advantageous one where that was just the, uh, particularly under first fray, where it was just the opposite under straight furs. Now, another issue that comes up quite frequently are interest accrual dates, or IADs, as we call them. Now, under both SERS and FERS, um, there's a two-year grace period on military deposits on the interest. After the two-year period, interest is accrued and compounded annually at a variable interest rate. So just be aware of that. Now, this creates some situations. For SERS people, um, for employees who were first hired under SERS before 10-183, interest begins to accrue on 10-185. For employees hired under SERS on or after 10-183, interest begins to accrue two years from the date the employee was first employed under SERS. Okay, so their first appointment when they're covered under SERS, if they're employed on or after 10-183, interest begins to accrue two years from that date. 
if the military service was performed after the date of first employment and after 10-183, then interest for that period of military service begins two years from the date that the employee returns to a position that's subject to SERS or SERS offset. So when you come back to that position that is then subject to retirement contributions under SERS or SERS offset, that begins your new interest accrual date. Now, um, and this is going to be the same for FERS when we get there, but if you have multiple periods of military service, each period of military service is going to have a different interest accrual date, okay? So if you perform discrete periods of military service, each discrete period of military service is going to have an addition, an individual interest accrual date. So you will have multiple interest accrual dates for each discrete period of military service. And the other thing I want to reemphasize here is that, say, for example, interest starts to accrue. I get my initial interest accrual date, and then I'm separated from federal service, and then I come back to an appointment later on that is covered. I don't get a new interest accrual date for that previous period of military service. My IAD was that IAD when I was first covered after performing that military service. And interest will accrue through that entire period, even though I wasn't on the agency rolls for a period of time. Okay, so you get one interest accrual date for each period of service, even if you have a subsequent break in service after that period of covered service, interest will continue to accrue. For FERS people, and again, everything I just said for as far as the interest accruing and everything applies to FERS people as well. For FERS employees first employed before January 1st, 1987, interest begins to accrue on January 1st, 1989. For employees first employed on or after 1187, interest is going to begin to accrue two years from the date the employee was first subject to FERS deductions, okay? So again, very similar to SERS, right? It's just a different date because FERS didn't actually come into existence until January 1st, 1987. So the earliest that you could start um, accruing interest after that two-year grace period would be January 1st, 1989. Or if you were hired on or after 1187, it will begin to accrue two years from whatever date you first became subject to FERS. Now, if the military service was performed after the date of first employment and after January 1st, 1987, interest begins to accrue two years from the date the employer returned to a position subject to FERS. Okay, so in this situation, you were covered under FERS, you left to go into the military, and you performed a period of military service and then you came back to a position subject to FERS. When you came back to a position subject to FERS, that period of military service, that intervening period of military service, the interest accrual date would be two years from the date that you returned to federal service and became subject to FERS. Now, employees who transfer to FERS and have a SERS component continue to be under the SERS military deposit rolls for military service performed prior to the transfer. Because remember, the transfer is something that you elect to do. For employees who elect FERS coverage and don't have a SERS component, interest begins to accrue two years from the date of the transfer. Now, here is another question that we get quite often and requests that we get quite often as far as paid in full letters and IRRs. If an employee completed their military deposit at another agency or claims to have completed their military deposit at a previous agency, the military deposit IRR will be on file with OPM or it should have been sent to OPM upon separation or transfer, okay? That's the way what the payroll offices are supposed to do. If an employee separates or moves to another agency and they've completed their military deposit, those IRRs, those payroll cards should have been sent to OPM at separation, okay, or at transfer if they left and went to somewhere else. So once that, so OPM will already have a record of that. And when we assemble the retirement case, all those records in the file are gonna be put together. 
Um, OPM does not require a paid in full letter. Uh, we don't need that. We've already got the IRR with the stamp saying paid in full. If the employee actually did pay it, that military deposit in full, or in your case, as the agency personnel, if they claim to have completed that military deposit, there's no real advantage to an employee um, deceiving their agency about that because when it comes to OPM, when they go to retire, we are going to know because we're going to have all the records and we won't be able to credit their service if they didn't pay it in full. So there's no real advantage to an employee deceiving their agency and saying they paid it when they actually didn't. Um, OPM would have a record of that. Um, we don't require the current agency to provide a copy of the IRR from the former agency. I know I get a lot of requests from agencies um, where a military deposit was, perform was paid at a prior agency and that current agency, even though the employee is claiming to have paid it in full and is completely comfortable with that, the former agency, the current agency now that they're employed at is requiring um, a copy of a paid in full letter or an IRR. Um, and so a lot of times um, what's happening is, is the current agency, when that employee retires from that agency, they're sending a copy of that IRR to OPM along with the retirement package. We don't need that. In fact, we don't want that. Um, in fact, if you are going into our retirement data viewer at all and um, accessing retirement cards from a prior agency and printing out copies of those and submitting them with a retirement package, we ask that you stop doing that. We don't need retirement cards from prior agencies. They're already, if they're in the data viewer, we already have access to them. If, um, and they would be in our files as well. So we do not need the current agency that is preparing a package for retirement to include prior payroll cards from another agency printed out from the data viewer, including this um, post-56 military deposit because we already have them on file. And it creates a huge problem for our file section up in Boyers. They have limited space and submitting all this additional paperwork really causes a hardship for them. So if you're doing this, be aware, stop. If you're not doing this, fantastic. The current agency should not be requesting, again, um, payroll cards um, from OPM if the current employee claims to have completed the deposit, unless, of course, the current agency suspects that there is an error or if the employee comes to you and says, I'm not sure if I paid it in full or I don't remember if I paid my military deposit. In a case like that, you can access the data viewer, you can request, um, you know, you can do the, the facts back to see if there's a military deposit um, IRR on file with us. But if the person, the employee coming to you for counseling or preparing for retirement claims to have completed that military deposit, that's good enough, okay? There does have to be a certain amount of responsibility that falls to the employee. And they should know if they completed their military deposit or not. If they don't, that would be the only reason to request it, that or you suspect that there's an error. Now, speaking of errors, uh, generally once a military deposit is completed, agencies cannot refund the military deposit. That means even if somebody was receiving military retired pay, they completed their military deposit, and then they come to you, to you the agency, and say, you know, I made that military deposit with you, and I am receiving military retired pay, but I've decided I don't want to ma waive the military retired pay, so I want my military deposit back, you cannot refund that to them. You absolutely cannot refund that to them. That has to wait until the person retires, and then they can make a written request to OPM, and OPM will refund that to them. Uh, if you were to refund that to them, uh, there's a potential where the employee could then come to OPM, bring canceled checks and say, see, I did make the deposit and we won't have a payroll card um, reflecting that and we'll be going back to that agency asking for the money because the employee seems to have proven that they paid the military deposit. So again, don't even, don't even do that. Um, now there are a couple exceptions. There are a couple reasons why you can refund a military deposit. 
One of them is if it never should have happened in the first place because the service is not creditable. That is really the only time that you can refund that military deposit, is if it never should have happened in the first place. So example, um, you have a, pair, a person, an employee who made a military deposit and somebody happened to overlook the fact that the military deposit was based on a period of service for which there was a dishonorable discharge. Well, that service is not creditable, so the military deposit shouldn't have happened. So in a case like that, it's okay to refund that military deposit. Another situation that could occur is if the, prior, if the military deposit was for Title 32 time. If you suddenly, if somebody's making a military deposit or has completed one, but you haven't forwarded it to OPM yet, and you realize that, oh, we thought this was Title 10 time, but documentation comes in and it is actually Title 32 time that is not creditable. In a situation like that, you can refund that military deposit. That is really the only time that agencies should be refunding military deposits to anyone. Now, when an employee separates and subsequently requests a refund of all retirement contributions, any military deposits are also refunded to the person. If the employee is reemployed and wishes to make a redeposit, the refunded military deposit is going to be included and treated as, a, as part of the civilian redeposit at that point. Okay, so that's just something to be aware of. If you have an employee who separates and then later on comes to OPM because they've been separated for more than 30 days, they request a refund of all their retirement contributions, the military deposit is going to get refunded with that. That is then going to be included as part of that entire refund amount that needs to be repaid, okay, at, under the normal redeposit rules, okay? It's not going to be treated like they have to make the military deposit again and all that other stuff. It's going to be treated the same way as any other refund would be treated. Now, if an employee over or underpaid a military deposit, it is the current agency's responsibility to correct the error. This is done the same way that any other correction is done by submitting a 2806-1 or a 3100-1 to OPM. Okay, so just be aware of that. And so let's say you have somebody who um, should have paid $10,000 in a military deposit and they paid, you erroneously calculated it, or even a former agency erroneously calculated and, it, and it's $15,000. Um, you can submit a corrected IRR for that, okay? Um, a 2806-1 or a 3100-1, you can correct those payroll cards, okay? You can correct that information and fix that um, and refund that extra $5,000 to the employee. It, this is not the same as a refund as far as refunding a military deposit. This is actually correcting the error, correcting the military deposit amount to the correct amount, which is different than refunding a military deposit for someone. I get that question quite a bit. Our whole office gets that question quite a bit um, as far as corrections go. So just be aware of that. If there's an erroneous amount, you're fixing it just like you would fix any other retirement contributions. You do that on the 2806-1 or the 3100-1. Actually, the payroll office is gonna be doing this and fixing that military deposit to the correct amount. Now, Moving on, we have created um, a new BAL. It's BAL 17101. Uh, this should sound familiar to you because I discussed it um, last year, I think, um, in one of our benefits officers network meetings that this was going to be published. Um, and this BAL actually replaces BAL 13103, which was developed to remind agencies that generally employees must pay military service credit deposits to the agency before separation. Okay, this goes into a lot more detail. Now, 5 CFR 831-2104A and 842-307 have a provision that states that in the event of an administrative error related to the military service credit deposit, a former employee has the opportunity to make or complete the military deposit after separation. 
This is really the only time we're allowing military deposits after separation is in the case of administrative error. Now, what this BAL does, it discusses this. It provides a general discussion of what constitutes an administrative error related to a military service credit deposit. It reminds HR specialists of the necessity of counseling employees about paying those deposits when they have or return from active duty. Um, notifies HR specialists of the procedures that have to be followed by a former employee if the former employee believes that administrative error occurred and that that administrative error actually prevented them from being able to make or complete the military deposit before separation from federal civilian employment. Okay? It provides links to and an analysis of several decisions that have impacted the treatment of military deposits. So for those of you in the policy and legal areas, if you want to read some of the court cases and some of the decisions, the MSPB decisions, et cetera, that have actually um, created this whole situation, then definitely check out this BAL because there are citations about the court cases and discussions about that as well. Now, what this BAL does not do, it does not change any existing law or regulation. It doesn't change any of the documentation necessary, necessary to determine the creditability of military service. So again, just with the issuance of this BAL, it doesn't mean that we are going to accept points. We do not accept points at all. Uh, point summaries by themselves are not acceptable. I'm just saying this because we get this question a lot. Um, it does not delegate to any agency the authority to allow an individual to complete a belated military service credit deposit due to administrative error. So this is important because agencies are not the ones determining that um, an administrative error occurred. It is OPM who is going to determine if an administrative error occurred and determine whether or not we will allow a belated military deposit. The agency will not be making that determination. OPM will be making that determination. Now, let's talk about what an administrative error is. If um, an employee um, makes an inquiry with the agency HR, the employing agency provides material misinformation concerning the deposit and the consequences of not making a military deposit prior to separation, that would constitute an administrative error. So basically, if an employee comes to you and you provide erroneous information or a miscalculation or something that concerned the deposit and the consequence of that was the resulted in the employee not being able to make a deposit prior to separation or complete the deposit prior to separation, that's what we consider an administrative error. Now, deemed administrative errors are, um, are those errors where we just, uh, we, we, they're pretty straightforward. There are limited circumstances. Um, it, it would automatically enable an individual to belatedly complete the military deposit of their military de deposit to their prior employing agency after separation from employment. So again, remember, if we find administrative error, the employee is going to have to come back to the agency and make that military deposit with the agency, even though they've already separated. They're not going to be making the military deposit directly to OPM. They're going to have to go back and make the deposit through the agency, and the agency through their payroll office is going to have to submit that to OPM, even though the person is already separated. Now, the Federal Erroneous Retirement Coverage Corrections Act, or as everybody knows it, FERCA, uh, the, uh, in a situation like that, this is one deemed administrative error. The deposit was not paid in full because the agency enrolled the employee in the wrong retirement plan or the amount of the deposit was misstated. Now, if deposit calculation errors are discovered after separation, a FERS deposit was computed instead of a SERS deposit, uh, failure to account for higher deductions in the years 1999 and 2000 because, as you know, retirement contributions went up and therefore the military deposits went up as well. Um, also, if the employing agency 
um, commenced interest as of the wrong interest accrual date. That could constitute an administrative error. Um, military deposit payments have to be completed at the employing agency when payroll provider before final separation from employment. Completed means that the final payment has already been processed or will be processed in the final payroll closeout if done by payroll deductions. Now, if the employee alleges to OPM after retirement that the employing agency took or neglected to take an action involving the military deposit, which actually influenced or caused the individual not to initiate or complete the deposit, OPM is going to determine if the circumstances constitute an administrative error. OPM will decide if the circumstances warrant uh, allowing the individual to make a belated military deposit to his or her um, former employing agency. And if an employee who did not complete payment of the military deposit believes that the failure to pay was caused by an employer's administrative error and wants to complete payment after retirement, the employee or the retiree has to come to OPM and request a finding of administrative error, okay? This is important. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions from agencies where they, the employee is coming to the agency saying, I think there was an administrative error, and they're doing this after separation or right at separation. If they want to complete the military deposit, if they want to do this as a belated military deposit after separation, they would need to come directly to OPM, okay? The, the, employee, the, the agency is not going to make a finding of administrative error. If an employee comes to you as an agency while the person is still on their roles, yes, there may be an error, but that would be an instance where the employee would have to rethink their separation date because in essence, um, you're going to have to wait to get that resolved or after retirement, they could come to OPM and request a finding of administrative error. The employee may submit the request with OPM with the retirement package. The request should include a signed statement from the employee asserting in detail what they believe the administrative error was, how the error caused the employee to fail to make the timely deposit payment, and, and here's the big thing, why they chose not to delay their retirement separation in order to complete the deposit. Okay, so if you've got somebody who's just going to retire voluntarily and they suddenly assert that they have an administrative error, well, because that retirement is voluntary, it's going to be highly unlikely that OPM will rule in that employee's favor if, for example, they catch this while they're still on the agency rolls. There's no reason for that employee to not postpone their retirement date until the situation gets resolved. There may be instances where an employee will not be able to um, delay their retirement, but in most cases, particularly if it's a voluntary retirement, that employee will be able to delay their separation date. Obviously, um, there are situations where it may be different, but again, OPM is going to make that determination. Um, so but the employee is going to actually have to um, document why they chose not to postpone their separation and it is going to have to be a valid reason, not just while well, I wanted to retire on my birthday. Input from the agency that may support or dispute the allegations of the employee administrative error by the agency can also be included. However, remember that agency input pertaining to administrative error is not required unless the agency issued a written decision to the employee denying the eligibility to make deposit for one or more periods of military service. Now, the agency may submit an agency statement at its discretion explaining what action it took with respect to counseling the employee and information on why the employee chose not to delay his or her retirement separation in order to complete the deposit. But be aware, any statement forwarded by the agency in this context becomes part of the retirement record and is reviewable in any subsequent litigation that should happen. So let's say OPM denies, uh, find it, de denies that an administrative error occurred and that um, employee then decides to appeal that. 
um, to the Merit Systems Protection Board. Um, any statement forwarded by the agency would be part of that evidence. So again, agencies should just be aware of this, that this becomes part of the retirement record and it does, should, there, should anything end up in the court system or under legal appeal, that this is what's going to happen. Now, as far as submitting a request after retirement, a separated employee can also submit the request to OPM alleging administrative error directly to OPM if they choose. The retirement application should wait until the, until, uh, the, the applicant should actually wait until um, the case is assigned to an OPM claim number so that the request can be associated correctly. So they should wait until they get a notification from OPM giving them the retirement claim number. Um, because what, uh, what's going to end up happening is a lot of times those papers are coming in. If the employee submits this request alleging administrative error and they haven't put enough identifying information on for us to make an association with the retirement case that could conceivably get lost. Um, so again, it's best for the employee um, or the former employee retiree to wait until they get a CSA number from OPM if they're going to file directly with OPM so that they can include their CSA number so we can associate it with that retirement case much more easily. Now the request should be sent to our main address here, which is OPM Retirement Operations Center, PO Box 45, Boyers, Pennsylvania, 16017-0045. Now, what's going to happen once OPM gets this? Well, um, if it's a, we could say, okay, it's approved. We will allow you, we will make a finding of administrative error and we will allow you to make this belated military deposit. We could say, yeah, we looked at all the evidence and we are denying you the ability to make a belated military deposit. Because, for example, some person could have made their military deposit, it could have been caught before separation, but the employee was had chose to separate on a had chosen to separate on a voluntary retirement for no other reason than that's just the date that they wanted to go out. Um, and they could have postponed it, but they chose not to. Um, in a case like that, more than likely that would be denied. Um, we could say that a belated deposit, a belated military deposit is referred for a clearinghouse review because we need to investigate this more. Um, there could be extenuating circumstances. We actually need to do a little bit of research or this could be a finding where um, there's a lot, there are a lot more extenuating circumstances. Now, what's going to happen with the retirement case? Well, OPM is not going to delay, delay processing of the retirement packages due to an applicant's allegation of administrative error with respect to a military deposit unless it is determined that the administrative error exists, okay? Now, if a belated military deposit is approved, OPM is going to notify the employee of the specific time period granted to exercise the belated military deposit option. So they're going to have a time frame where they are going to have to complete this deposit and for the agency to complete its actions. Also, OPM is going to send a letter to the last employing agency informing them of our decision and um, if the bladed military deposit is denied, the employee must be given an initial OPM decision with reconsideration rights. So due process opens up at that point if we initially deny it. Now a copy of the denial is also going to be forwarded to the benefits officer at the last employing agency after due process is exhausted. Any deposit has to be administered by, should we choose to approve a belated military deposit, any deposit must be administered by that agency's payroll provider. And if it's completed, the military deposit must be received by OPM no later than the expiration date of the belated military deposit election time frame that's going to be specified by OPM whenever we send that notification to that uh, former agency. And at this point, that is really it. Um, I'm going to open things up for questions now. So, and I think we have a question.
Okay, Mike, this first person is asking if an employee has an honorable Army Air National Guard 214 with a separation of authority that appears to be under Title 32, is that acceptable? Can they buy this service? Generally, Title 32 time is not ex is not creditable military service. Again, um, I would suggest that um, you refer to one of our prior military um, uh, webcasts that we did. They're both on OPM's YouTube channel. We have one specifically that deals with USERRA provisions, um, and we have one that's the general military service. We go into detail about Title 10 and Title 32 time, but generally speaking, I mean, not always, but generally speaking, Title 32 time is not creditable, generally. But as you know, there are always exceptions, so I just want to make sure that we're aware of that. Again, review one of the um, prior webcasts we did, because that's a whole other webcast, actually. This next person is asking, I was hoping to find out during the webcast how OPM plans to treat retirees with military deposits based upon point statements, and more importantly, current employees with deposits that have paid in full with point statements as documentation. Point statements by themselves are not creditable or are not cre um, not acceptable by documentation. There would have to, again, um, in a case like that, that you will probably, if, the if they're still an employee with you, um, you are gonna need to get uh, those things never should have been accepted. We've never taken point summaries. Um, now, let's be clear here. Um, there were, and I think this will help resolve this. I know I've gotten this question a lot, and I've gotten this question from a lot of different agencies that OPM used to take point summaries and now they don't, what changed? OPM never accepted point summaries, okay? Again, as you know, the military deposit is paid to the agency before separation, and OPM never sees the documentation for the military deposit or never really evaluates it and looks at it until after this person applies for retirement and we're actually processing the retirement case. Now, what I think really changed was the retirement audit. Because remember, now we're looking at all these cases for a healthy retirement case. We're going through all these records and we're rejecting cases where point summaries are the only thing that's included for, for a military deposit. Your payroll office um, or the agency may have accepted those point summaries. And in a lot of cases, those point summaries had erroneous information. And later on, when that person retired, um, it created a lot of problems because, for example, there was a lot of times non-creditable service that was included in those point summaries. And so if the person needed that military service for eligibility to retire, those people were then bounced back to the agency as, an erroneous, as a potential erroneous separation. So, I mean, this is in the agency's best interest not to, not to accept these point summaries at all by themselves as well. So it's really important that you, you're aware of this appropriate documentation. Now, the reason it, it seems to have changed, again, is because the retirement audit is catching these because we're reviewing all these cases and then um, alerting the agency if it's not a healthy retirement case. Prior to the retirement audit, what used to happen is, again, this, this um, incomplete documentation would be sent to OPM and OPM would have to develop for the additional documentation, but they were already off the agency's roles and the agency never saw this. So this created a huge workload for OPM for the, for the um, legal administrative specialist who was actually processing the retirement case. And this would actually also hold up the retiree's annuity because we would have to go back and try and get all this additional documentation. So again, we've never accepted point summaries. It's just that agencies were really didn't see the consequences of only accepting a point summary prior to the, the healthy case audit because we would just go out and develop for that. We're not doing that anymore. And in many cases, it caused the agencies a hardship by just accepting that point summary anyway. So again, um, 
if you have somebody who only has a point summary, you need to tell them, and this information is in the SERS and FERS handbook, and that chapter, again, hasn't been updated since the 90s, so clearly this has been out there for a while, that they need to go back to that component or that branch of service and get a transcript of service detailing what service is actually creditable for retirement purposes, because I guarantee you, with those point summaries, not all of that service is always creditable. Okay, I'm going to phrase this a little differently than, than initially here because it's, this one starts with 214s usually have no indication of what title of active duty was, you know, was, they were performed under. I'm not sure that's the case. So let's phrase it a little differently. If they have a 214 that shows it's honorable service but it doesn't specify the title, what do they do then? Well, um, again, you're going to have to look at that you may need a little bit more information because um, you're going to have to go if it doesn't specify that there's that the, the, the um, provision of law that or the title that that service was performed under clearly that DD 214 is incomplete so you're going to need to go back and um, get more information I mean that's something that the agency is going to need they do to ask whether the 214 should be amended yes or, or they could also get a letter from the from the branch. Yes, you can get. A, you're going to have to go back to the branch of service and find out exactly what was going on. I mean, there's going to be additional information needed in a case like that. Um, it's just like anything else. Military service. I mean, that's something I want to clarify right up front here. Military service, in a lot of ways, is no different than any other service. If you had a question about civilian service that occurred and you were unsure whether that service was creditable or not, if you didn't have appropriate documentation to determine whether that service was creditable or not, um, before you separated that person for retirement, what would you do? It's the same thing with military service. You need to go get more information to verify that that service is creditable for retirement purposes. Um, I'll give you another example that's actually a lot more common than that. Say somebody gives you the wrong copy of the DD-214. We see that quite a bit. They submit the wrong copy of the DD-214. I think they submit copy one instead of copy four. And copy four, I believe, is the one that has the character of service. Okay, it has the actual, whether it was under honorable conditions or not. If you get something and it has no character of discharge or it's uncharacterized, you cannot use that you need a character of service in order to even accept the military deposit for that. So it would be the same thing. Okay, next question. When we have an individual who starts their civilian employment, they have a two-year grace period before the interest will start to accrue on their post-56 military deposit. Do they still have an additional third year to pay the deposit before the interest would actually be applied to the amount due? Yes. They actually, um, so interest begins to accrue after the two-year interest-free grace period, right? So from the time that that two-year period starts, remember, interest accrues annually. So you've got, well, on that interest accrual date, they've got the two-year interest-free grace period, then interest starts to accrue. They've got that whole year to pay that military deposit. But once they hit that interest accrual date, interest for that one year will have accrued. And so it'll keep accruing every year thereafter. So just to take this a step further, if they don't pay it on that third year and interest accrues, then they will have interest for one year that has accrued. However, after that third year, interest will start to accrue for the fourth year, right? Um, and if they pay that whole thing off before they hit that next interest accrual date, then the anniversary of that interest accrual date, then they won't have accrued interest for that next year. So it just continues on. So it's an annual thing. As long as they pay it before they hit the anniversary of their interest accrual date, they will be fine. Skipping a few, there's some of these we're going to have to answer off offline because they, they yeah yeah they and for specific, specific questions, let me let me kind of um, help you here. Um, if you're submitting questions about specific instances of a retirement case, uh, do not send them 
to this email. And, and in fact, if you um, do not send them to this email, um, what I would suggest you do is you reach out to, if, you are, if you're not the headquarters benefits officer, submit them to your headquarters benefits officer first. Um, if you don't know who your headquarters benefits officer is, we have a listing on OPM's website. Um, also, um, if you go to B, you'll have um, benefits officers um, information and there's a benefits officers directory there that'll give you the name, phone number, email address of your headquarters benefits officer. If you are a headquarters benefits officer and you have specific case related, individual case related inquiries, Again, do not submit them to this box for this presentation. Um, submit them to your OPM liaison because in situations where it's really case specific, there may be additional research that's going to be done. And so clearly this is not the forum to deal with that, um, you know, on very case related specific individual stuff. Okay. Um, reach out to your liaison. Okay, next up, how can you obtain a copy of what your employer has paid into the military deposit when he transfers for another agency? So they're paying the deposit with one finance center. Now they come to you with a new agency. How do you get that information? Okay, um, that, um, some of that should have transferred over with uh, OPF. Um, in addition, uh, you know, if it, you can always um, go into the data viewer. If the agency has closed out that payroll card um, as a partially paid and sent it to OPM. So it should either be in the OPF or it could be um, at OPM if you access the data viewer, if those records are imaged, um, you should be able to access it there. Um, again, you could reach out to the prior agency. They may actually have that information. Uh, still on file if it's a recent um, if it's a recent um, change from one agency to another that other that prior agency may actually have that also the employee is a good resource too because the employee may actually have that documentation as well okay uh, this is if a person retires uh, say at the say at the end of this month but the military deposit isn't calculated until a week before the retirement can you submit a copy of the military deposit package and check that was sent to the payroll office with the retirement package? One more time? Sure. It's a, it's a, a short notice retirement. Military deposit wasn't calculated until a week before they retired. Um, can they submit a copy of the military deposit package and a copy of the check that was sent to the payroll office with the retirement package? In other words, they won't have a paid in full yet. Um, as we talked about on the prior slide, um, whenever the agency, whenever that payroll office closes out the final payroll card for that employee, uh, that military deposit needs to be completed by then. So if it was sent to the payroll office, if the payroll office closes out that military, uh, accepts that military deposit and closes out that record and it's all sent to OPM together, then that's great. If for some reason um, the person gets separated from the agency roles and the payroll office closes out that military card and the payroll and the military deposit is not completed, then at the payroll office, then that's, not good um, and there would and that would constitute a potential belated military deposit in which case um, you know th they would have to the employee would have to justify why they're not waiting until that is actually approved I mean you know if there's if there's any flexibility with the, regard to the employee that they would have to I would suggest that they consider changing their retirement date um, until that is all done because I mean if you had let me give you an example if you have an employee who had military service 10 years ago and they wait until the week before retirement to submit their military deposit or um, you know as long as, again as long as the payroll office um, has created an IRR for that card and sent it along and processed it along 
with the other retirement cards before they close out the record, then that's fine. But if they haven't, then we've got a problem. Um, so what we usually what we usually see happen is something that doesn't fall that close. Um, a lot of times you'll have an employee like a week before um, they are scheduled to retire requesting their military earnings. Well, as we all know, that military deposit is not going to get computed before separation. So that employee should consider changing their retirement date because otherwise we are not gonna be able to use that military service. And unless there are some really extenuating circumstances, I can't imagine any reason why we would, why we would find, make a finding of administrative error, particularly if that employee was counseled correctly previously. If an employee is removed while paying a military deposit, what happens to the amount the employee already paid and are they able to continue paying on it? Um, again, refer to BAL 17101. Again, um, in a case like that, if they're removed, um, if they were making the, the deposit, um, we have to look at what was going on. I, again, this is, a, this is one of those situations where OPM will make a finding of administrative error. If we don't, if we find that administrative error didn't occur and it was, and allow them to complete that belated military deposit, then um, we would treat it, if we find that um, there was no administrative error, then basically what's gonna end up happening is that would be treated as a partially paid military deposit and it's gonna get refunded to the person and they are not going to get credit for that military service. So again, it's pretty straightforward. Either the deposit is completed before separation or if it's not completed before separation, then the employee needs to come to OPM to request a belay, uh, the ability to uh, on finding of administrative error in order to complete that belated military deposit. It's as simple as that. It has to be done before retirement period. The only exception is administrative error. Okay, um, actually, I, actually they, were, they were talking about removed, not retired. Um, so at, as a separatee, they can't pay into anything. Um, and the money stays with OPM, right, until? Correct. If they're removed and they're not eligible for retirement, um, in a case like that, that partially paid amount stays with OPM, but interest is going to continue to accrue on the remainder. Um, should they ever get another covered position, that intervening break, interest is still gonna accrue during that. And when they're subsequently in another covered position, should they be reemployed in a federal agency, then at that point, they can resume payment of the military deposit. But keep in mind that the whole time they were off the rolls, interest is gonna be accruing. Okay, this one says the instructor states that there is no need for a retirement specialist to submit the military deposit completion letter with the retirement package. If OPM finds that the employee never made the deposit, but the retirement specialist annotated that on the MSD when the MSD was completed, will the agency be charged for an error, error in the audit? Well, I mean, I. You know, as far as the audit goes, I can't really speak to that. I mean, um, if the employee on the application is stating that they completed the military deposit, I mean, that's really what you're going to have to, to go by. I mean, at some point, this comes down to personal responsibility on the part of the employee. And again, there's no reason for the employee to lie because what may end up happening, it would create the potential for um, for damage to the employee of not being truthful in their answer as to whether or not they completed that military deposit is quite substantial and there's no advantage because OPM would have those records. Now, if there's a discrepancy, let's say for example, the person did complete their military deposit, but for whatever reason, the payroll card was never forwarded to us. Well, the current agency 
couldn't have forwarded that payroll card to us, correct? Because it would have happened at a former agency. So I don't see any reason why you would, you know, why it would be a penalty to you because you, you had no control over that. You know, if they paid their military deposit in full, say, at OPM, and then they moved to um, Department of Defense, and they're going to actually be retiring from Department of Defense. And OPM, for whatever reason, never sent the military deposit payroll card to our record center in Boyers, Pennsylvania, or something happened and we have no record of it, um, but the employee can, pr can prove that they actually paid it, well, that would be OPM's fault. It wouldn't be any fault of DOD. So, you know, again, um, I don't see how the current agency could be at fault given that, you know, the employee is, is, is stating, is certifying that they did complete this military deposit in full. So, you know, that, I don't see any reason why the current agency, if, if there's no deposit to be made at the current agency, I don't see how the, the current agency could be at fault. Next up, please explain what the equivalent of a 214 is. Well, it's going to have to show the, the character of service, you know, the nature of the discharge. It's going to have to show that that service was creditable, you know, that it was active duty service that is creditable for civilian retirement purposes. So again, in most cases, Title X time, if it's reserve time or active duty military service, it's going to have to show, um, you know, all, all the, all, basically everything that, that the DD-214 shows, that this is active honorable service, that pay and allowances were withheld, that, you know, it is potentially creditable for civilian time. Again, the Sirs and Furs Handbook really goes into detail as to what constitutes creditable military service. Um, you know, there are a lot of different things that we can get into, but basically DD-214 or equivalent is just that. If you look at all the information on the DD-214, you're going to need to know the from and to dates, the entry into active duty, the discharge dates, if there was any lost time, um, the amount of creditable service, um, you know, what provision of law it was performed under. And whether uh, it's honorable. And whether, and the character of discharge. Okay, next up, would an employee be responsible to pay old interest if the HR office did not make a timely action to process when they requested the military deposit? Uh, yeah, they, um, I mean, the interest accrual date is the interest accrual date. So, you know, they, the employee is actually responsible for, for that. There's no act, they're actually, and this goes not just for military deposits, but civilian deposits, redeposits, everything. There is no provision in law for OPM to waive interest of any kind, okay? We do not have the ability, we do not have the legal authority to waive interest on any deposits. Not military deposits, not civilian deposits, not redeposits for prior refunded service. Interest accrues based on the law and there is no provision to waive that. Now. Let's say the agency makes a mistake and realizes, in, as in this situation, oh, you know, it was our fault. Well, if the agency chooses to pay the interest for that employee, if the agency chooses to foot the bill for that interest, that's between the employee and the agency. OPM has nothing to do with that. OPM is required to collect the interest that has accrued based on the law. And so, therefore, the interest is going to continue to accrue. Who actually pays that interest is irrelevant. Is, uh, OPM doesn't care. We, we just need the interest. If an employee is retiring and they are retired military and not waiving their retired pay and they do not want to make a deposit, do you need to... Do you still, does OPM still need the uh, initial 214 as part of the retirement package? Well, it's nice to have those, that documentation because, um, you know, it, it does document the service. But if they are, if they have not paid their military deposit, remember, they cannot pay their military deposit 
for um, after they separate, correct? Now, they could conceivably um, become reemployed and become a reemployed annuitant. So, again, it might be of some value if they were to decide to do this later on, if they maybe were eligible for a redetermined annuity at some point. Uh, now we're really getting into the weeds here and looking at some exceptional situations. Um, that being said, it, from your perspective as an agency, if the person is receiving military retired pay, they did not pay any military deposit whatsoever with either your current agency or any former agency, so there are no military deposits floating around out there, then in a case like that, um, the person says they have received, they're in receipt of military retired pay, they're not waiving their military retired pay, and on the application they check that they did not make the military deposit, then there would be no reason because the service is not gonna be creditable. What documents are accepted for verification of academy time? Well, we're going to need um, basically transcripts of um, the, the 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 academy the academy transcripts. Um, we're going to need definitely need that showing the you know the time that they were in the academy. Um, I'm trying to think what else they need. That's that's it. There's that's, no, there's yeah, no that's, I'm, I'm trying no, to think if there's anything else I'm there's missing. No stipend paid, there's no stipend paid. behind it. So yeah, so there the academy time. I mean, it's basically the the transcripts of service um, or the tran the academic transcript showing that they actually performed that that service. There's more, there's just too many more, I'm kind of... <laughs> okay. Uh, a person with two military, two military service periods, is it possible to pay a deposit for only one period of service? Yes, it is, and they're actually going to have separate interest... Excuse me. They're actually going to have separate interest accrual dates as well, because each discrete period of military service technically should have separate interest accrual dates. So it is conceivably possible that a person may choose to pay one period of military service and not pay another. I'll give you an example. I recently had um, this question come across my desk. Um, an agency had a person who had multiple periods of military service. Okay, so they, had a, they, had, they didn't have enough for a military retirement, but they had multiple periods of military service. And Basically, they were, they were close to retirement and they knew they wanted to retire within the next year. So they had a period of military service, they had a couple periods of military service that were actually later in their career. They had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, in and out periods of military service, but they had some, the, like the last two periods of military service would have allowed them to retire much earlier, um, would have given them, would have put them um, given them enough service credit to actually retire on the date that they wanted. And so, of course, the people wanted to pay, the person wanted to pay just those last two periods of military service because, for one thing, those periods of mil those last two periods of military service, when you think back, remember how we talked about interest accrual dates, right? Um, interest accrues, starts accruing two years after the the date that they enter covered service. Um, so those interest accrual dates for those um, last two periods of military service because they were intervening between breaks of civilian service were actually um, would be, had different, each one had different interest accrual dates so they would have paid a lot, lot less interest for that military time. So they can do that. They can pay for discrete periods of military service.
I'm not not sure if we can tackle this one or not. Can you explain how new military how the new military deposit process within remedy remedy that's yeah. it seems that we can now upload three deposits no this is not never mind that's that looks like uh, a technical payroll question that that looks like possibly even uh, software specific okay yeah I couldn't couldn't quite answer that one yeah, we, um, different agencies use different software um, yeah This one was the interest accrual date. We already covered that. And again, remember, if you have specific questions about a specific retirement case, you should be contacting your headquarters benefits officer first. And if you are a headquarters benefits officer, definitely reach out to your OPM liaison specifically, because again, I don't want to end up uh, trying to answer a really detailed question here with general information. In some cases, we may actually need to examine the DD-214. We may have to tell you, well, you need to get a little bit more information here or there. So again, that's why you would want to involve your liaison so that you get the most, um, the, you get a correct answer the first time, right? So we're not going back and forth with this because as you know, um, trying to answer a very specific question generally will a lot of times not give you everything you need and it may actually lead you down the wrong path. So that's like the last thing that we want to do. Can an employee who resigns request a refund of their military service deposit only without, no. without getting the <laughs> retirement contributions? No. When you request a refund, if you resign, and apply for a refund, you get a refund of everything you paid into the system, not just the military. You have to get a refund of all your, all your contributions. If a military appointee is separated on 12017, which many did, <laughs> due to an administrative change, can the employee request a belated military deposit to OPM? The an employee can always request a belated military deposit to OPM, but however, again, OPM is going to make the fine make a determination as to whether or not an administrative error occurred. Now, in a situation like that, let's say that employee was already aware that they owed a military deposit. Depending on when that military service was completed, um, they may have had an opportunity to complete that. So in a case like that, if they had an opportunity, if they had had an opportunity to complete that, we're probably not gonna find that an administrative error occurred, specifically if they were counseled. And depending on when, when that occurred, again, that is something, that's a situation, again, where an employee should write directly to OPM and request, uh, if, they, if they believe an administrative error occurred, if there was an error, like the, the HR office never counseled the employee about the uh, making a military deposit, they're claiming they never knew they could make a military deposit, something like that, then in a situation like that, they should be coming to OPM and requesting a finding of administrative error. The agency cannot make that finding. You should not, the agency should not be contacting OPM on behalf of former employees um, who are requesting a finding of administrative error, okay? So again, the former agency should not be coming to OPM requesting a finding of administrative error for a former employee. The, the former employee needs to write to OPM directly to request that finding if they've already been separated. Okay, well, I guess that's about it. Uh, thank you guys so much. And again, don't forget to check out um, any of our other webcasts and um, 
informational videos that we've done on OPM's YouTube channel. We've got a lot of information out there. We've got information on non-appropriated funds. We've got information on USERA. We've got information on post-56 military deposits. We've got a SERS and FERS overview out there that is great to show to employees if you want to give them kind of a pre-retirement seminar. Um, we've got information on civilian deposits and redeposits. There's a lot of good stuff out there. We've got stuff that that's just with retirement. We've got other information out there too with regard to staffing, pay and leave. Um, Phil Gardner has done a couple webcasts on healthy cases, which you can, you can review. So again, uh, don't forget to check us out and look at any of the other information that we've provided already. And thank you for tuning in today.